Hey, good morning, good afternoon, everybody. I am so happy to be here this holiday week with Dr. Neil Bernard, who is, uh, many of you know, uh, who has been a huge inspiration to me and we've had on before um, and really uh, has, you know, you've dedicated your life, <laughs> doctor, to not only helping human beings to uh, to to health and wellness and, and happiness uh, through the evidence-based work that you bring to the table and have done for many, many years in reversing diabetes and such. But what I really wanted to uh, to talk to you about this morning was some of the other work that you do. Um, so can, can, can you talk to, to us a little bit about, I'm interested in your story that you, you were in medical training how many years ago? Let's start there. Yes, well, I graduated from George Washington University in 1980 um, in the, their medical school. So it's quite some time back. Quite some time back. What prompted this work that you do now and for those of you who are watching what we're really talking about is ending animal labs in medical training that's what we're talking about isn't it so could you talk a little bit about that and what was the what was the moment that just made you go this is this has got to stop great yeah well first of all thank you for asking about that and um animals need all the friends they can get so thank you, thank you for raising that question. And, and um, you're, you, what you said is exactly right, that it started with the use of animals in medical training. And then from there, we started looking at the use of animals in testing and in research and, um, and as broad as we can possibly go. But what, what happened to me was I was sitting um, in the lecture hall at the medical school. And one day the instructor said, okay, next week is dog lab. Everybody form your groups. We need four to six students per dog and da, 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 da. We all knew exactly what this was because it was a little bit like, um, it was sort of half education, half hazing where the students gather around a table and the dog is led in and the dog is sort of nervously coming into the room and there's one dog for each table. And the students take the dog, tape the dog down to the table and then you anesthetize the dog and you put in an intravenous line and, um, you then, your manual then says, inject nor norepinephrine and you inject it. And then you notice that the pulse goes faster. So you write that down. You might even do an EKG tracing and you paste it into your report, uh, paste it into your report. And then it says inject propranolol and you do that. And then the heart goes slower and you do an EKG tracing and you paste that into your report. And then the instructions might say, uh, you can exsanguinate your dog. And so what that means is that you draw blood out of a vein and you keep drawing the blood out and you draw it out, and you draw it out and you draw it out. And you notice that as you do this, the EKG will go through changes um, as well and the blood pressure will start to drop. And then at some point you've drawn out so much blood that the pulse stops. And at that point, the students look at each other and one says to the other, is she, dead and the other says i think so and they're they're trying to see if there's a pulse and whatever and at the end of that day they're all at home all the students are home back in the laboratory there's a line of trash bags all up and down the hallway outside the lecture lecture hall and at dinner the students are explaining to their girlfriends boyfriends husbands uh, wives parents what they did that day. And the people they're eating with are thinking, you just killed your first patient. Um, anyhow, I was not necessarily a very cocky medical student, but when they suggested that, when they said, form your groups, everybody next week is dog lab. I said, I'm not gonna do that. And as he was approaching me saying, you know, I'm not asking you, this is, this is actually a requirement. But just as these words were coming out of his lips, the student next to me said, he's not doing the dog lab. I'm not doing the dog lab either. So we had a movement of two of us who were not gonna do the dog lab and we didn't. Um, but we, we wrote a report of what norepinephrine and propranolol and exsanguination do. We all passed the course without killing anybody. Um, and I found myself thinking, wait a minute, 
not only do the dogs die that day, something dies in the mind of the student that day, which was that idea that I'm going to preserve life. I'm going to, you know, even, even if it's in a package, I may not exactly understand. Um, I'm going to do what I can to prevent suffering. And they've decided to kind of compromise on these things. And that's not good. So the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine got started in 1985. And I thought, okay, job one, we have to train students to be compassionate and eliminate all the things that threaten it. And so we started working with medical schools to get rid of the dog labs and all the things that you'd imagine happened. They said, well, we'll switch to pigs. People don't care about pigs. I said, wait a minute, that's not good enough. They said, we'll make it optional. I said, no, that's not good enough either, because if you make it optional, the students think they're going to have to do it to, 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 to stand out. So, no, you got to just stop it. And one by one, we were able to push the schools from the top, Harvard, Yale, Stanford, to, I mean, the whole list. And as of 2016, every single medical school where you get an MD degree or a DO degree, anything in the United States or Canada, they stopped even offering animal heads. Done, finished gone. So that's good. Then our next step was, okay, after the MD degree, pediatricians will uh, practice intubation. You take a live cat as a substitute for a human baby and you put tubes down the cat's throat so that you get uh, comfortable getting past the tongue and getting and so forth. And the cats get torn up and they're terrified. Um, you don't need to be doing this. So we showed, wait, wait, wait. What you care about is the anatomy of a human baby. Let's give you a simulator that you can use all night long in the call room so that you can do an intubation in your sleep because this is a simulator and it's exactly human anatomy. So one by one, the pediatrics residency said, you're right. Let's use the simulators. They're perfect human anatomy, better, much better teaching. All the animal labs gone. Finished. And then we started looking at trauma training and emergency medicine and surgical training. And now we've won at the vast majority, but there's still some left. There are maybe 30% uh, of the surgical programs are still using animals. We're, I, I have no doubt we will end it all. But it takes time and it takes fortitude and it takes pushing. And, and, and often it just takes educating what the better methods are. So we have a, a really good team of doctors and others who know how to do this kind of training in the right way. And they're sort of half diplomats too. So they work with the medical schools and medical centers to get them to change. Um, so that's been a huge area of, of great success, but our mission is not entirely done. Separate from that, animals used in testing. Um, are, how harmful are pesticides to people? How harmful are industrial chemicals? Um, what harms can come from, uh, say, a medication? They're all animal tested. Um, aren't there better ways? And the, the answer, of course, is yes, there are better ways, um, but they have to be advocated for and pushed. And so we've been working a lot with the Environmental Protection Agency and more recently with the Food and Drug Administration and others to move toward the non-animal methods. We've had a, similarly great success. Lots of these, these tests are falling by the wayside. That's great, but we're not done. And then the third big area is research per se. Um, Let's see, uh, what, what, what is an anti, is there an antidepressant effect of foods, for example? Some researchers are testing um, whether a spice might be, have an antidepressant effect. Well, it's, it's in some cases, instead of feeding it to human beings, they'll feed it to mice, rats, animals they think nobody could ever care for. And because they can't report depression, they use crude indicators of depression, one called the forced swim test. And forgive me for being a graphic. You take the mouse, you gavage the mouse to put in, say, the saffron or whatever you're testing. Uh, could it be an antidepressant? And then they, I'm not making this up. They throw the mouse into a tank of water and the mouse is struggling. And the research assistant has a stopwatch. And when the mouse stops struggling, they click the stopwatch and they've timed how long the mouse struggles as this crude indicator of their sort of joie de vivre. And the idea is that if you can make them struggle longer, then they must be less depressed, and then your thing worked. And I, obviously, anybody's gonna think this is just ridiculous. Why do people do that? Instead of doing experiments in an ethical way, the right way with humans, if you, which you can do it ethically, um, or other methods are sometimes just not bothering at all. Anyway, that's our work. It's sometimes painful. 
Um, it's always a lot of work, but we win. And that is our job is to bring this forward and make sure that we stop these experiments. We stop them as fast as possible, because when we do, we're not just we're not just helping um, eliminate uh, animal experiments and pr protecting the animals, but we're also freeing up these resources to do research in the right way that will protect human beings. Oh my gosh, that's so that's so true. I never thought about that, that it's actually freeing up the resources that would be going into these cruel animal labs and testing to to um, you know to to act to evolve basically and to do what you've been doing. You know, I, I'm so touched by your work. Somebody wrote in here, you you <laughs> are my hero. And and you really are because you know, you. I, I remember the the very first um, person that, that that I was very moved and touched by was Jane Goodall, who I'm sure you, you obviously you know her work okay. very well in chimp um, testing labs, which just broke my heart when I first saw that, and that she, to her like you, it was absolutely unacceptable, and she she like you were a visionary and envisioned this future where that was absolutely unnecessary and it was going to stop and you know and for her being a woman in that at the time in that field was 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 really tough so right. you know i just want to i want to thank you for being a visionary and for bringing something that as you say is enormously hard work that requires that you know it's your life's work on on top of everything else that you do you know no you must have so much energy to be able to do everything you do. And I know that you're powered by plants, so uh, solely powered by plants. <laughs> and so a lot of people say to me, how do you have so much energy? I'm like, powered by plants. And I know that you are too. So with this, with this um, work, that this important work that you're doing, where does that bring us now? So you've, you've eliminated these animal labs or you've helped to eliminate these animal labs in, in a very, very high percentage now of medical training and medical training hospitals. Um, where does that leave us and what needs to be done and how can we help? Thank you. Um, with regard to medical education, we still have a ways to go, but we've, as, as you said, we've won the majority. Um, with regard to animal testing, we're working here in domestically in the US, but we're also working worldwide because uh, let's say it's a cosmetic product. Yeah. It might be manufactured in New Jersey, but it might be sold in China or the opposite can be, can be the case. So that we have to have a team and our team is there not only to promote the alternatives, but to harmonize across countries. We work with something called the Organization of Economic uh, Develop, uh, Cooperation and Development, OECD to make sure that uh, a product manufactured in Japan doesn't have to do testing that would be illegal here in the United States. Um, so we're, we're very busy on that. Um, and we have a, a good team of, what, as I always say, they're half scientists, they're half diplomats um, to try to make this change go forward. So when people donate money to, to our work, um, that, goes, that allows us to, to bring on a bigger team for us to contract with scientific, scientists and to really do this advocacy work um, as uh, vigorously as we possibly can. Okay, great. So everybody who's watching, this is the year end, <laughs> year end gift, year end donation. I've certainly, you know, my my gift is, is, is has absolutely been to help your work and Thank you. will continue you to do so, um, you know, over and over again, because this work is so important. On so, I mean, we've touched on such a small piece of this today and there's just this, this uh, short interview, but there's so much more to be done. So um, for all of you watching, how can everybody donate? Because you're doing, you're matching a year, matching the gift, aren't you, at year end that everybody gives? Would you speak to that? That you're you're doing, you're matching the gift, right? So if we donate, you're matching that, correct? One dollar becomes two dollars, ten dollars becomes twenty dollars, and there are some folks who are in a position to give um, very very large amounts because of whatever it is, inherent uh, inheritance or uh, the stock market smile that day or whatever it is. Um, so the person who, who donates um, $10,000, that becomes, believe it or not, $20,000. And these are real. These are real matches. Um, so that's where we are right now. So 
um, we are hoping that um, people will be as generous as they're able to be. As you probably know, I don't take a salary at all. My time is entirely my donation. Um, and that's been the case for, for many, many years because um, we want to win and we want to put every dollar to you. So um, I'm very grateful to all the people who have supported us. I'm so grateful to you um, for your incredible support and for your um, just sharing this message with people as far and wide as you have, which goes yeah. a long way towards success. All right, so we have Karen on. She says, where do we donate? Can you give us very clear instructions how oh. we donate and what everybody can do? What's the call to action today on this thank holiday? You. Thank you, thank you, thank you. It's the easiest thing in the world. Um, our website is pcrm.org. That stands for Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine. And if you just go to pcrm.org, um, between now and the end of the year, you'll see a prominent donate button. Um, and it's something that people can respond to or share with others. So it's, it's right there, pcrm.org. And using that button now, your dollars will be matched. Great. And I've just put that in the chat. So it's pcrm. And whether you donate a dollar, ten dollars, any dollar amount, that will be matched. And, and as you heard, um, that this isn't this you are going to be doing this anyway you know i hear you really loudly and clearly it's like this is the mission this is the vision and i and i love that you're just like this is i want to do this and this is going to be happening and so certainly myself and 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 this community really wants to help you with this uh with this you know the, the, this work that is so so important and that you've done so much in the last 20 years to ending this um, misery and suffering. I mean, I, you haven't been graf too graphic on this interview about it, but I've read, I've done a lot of, uh, re you know, reading and research about the live, uh, you know, testing and the, the absolute misery that these dogs and cats uh, and suffering uh, go through, even before they're killed, um, is just absolutely despicable. It's just, it makes me sick to my stomach. So it's, the, um, I, I thank you, thank you, thank you. For, for this work that you're doing. Um, does anybody have any questions? Does anybody watching have any other questions? So you can just go to PCRM. That's where you can go. That's where you can make your donation. Um, and do you, do you envision a future where in medical training and testing and uh, medical testing, where it is completely unnecessary for animals to be used in any way, shape, or form. Yes, yes. Um, I think I think we can already make that case right now. Um, th this doesn't necessarily mean that research is an easy thing. Um, for the vast majority of, of areas, obviously we're, we're looking at human health. So we look at human genetics, we look at human clinical trials, look at human tissues, look at human behavior. These are all things that, that need to be studied. And there certainly are areas where, let's say, some of the most difficult ones, um, is a drug safe? We need to know the drugs are safe. So people will say, well, we're going to feed them to rats and mice and whatever. Um, the problem, of course, that we have, apart from the cruelty, and, and the cruelty is obvious. Um, you take the animals, rabbits, guinea pigs, in some cases dogs, in some cases cats. They're shipped from one place to another. The animals are typically bred. They've never known human kindness. They're boxed up, they're, sh they're shipped from one part of the country to another. They arrive, they're put in some kind of holding place where they're terrified. They can't control the light, the dark, they can't control what they eat. Um, and then the, the lab techs, uh, I hate to say this, and you'd like to think that people go into this because they're kind hearted. But the fact of the matter is when, when a person is, let's say force feeding a dog, a compound, the dogs fight, they struggle, they're afraid. And so sometimes because they're struggling and they're terrified, that irritates the people who are doing the force feeding. And sometimes they get a little bit abusive. Um, and all of these things go on day after day after day after day. They don't want to show you what they're doing. They don't want to uh, publicize pictures, but that's what research is all about. And all of these problems go forward even before the experiments begin, just with the shipping um, and the isolation, in some cases, the crowding. So that's why we need to change it. This doesn't mean that the results are necessarily applicable. After all, it's not human biology you're studying. You're looking at dog biology or rat or, or mouse. The, the animals are used because they're convenient. Um, 
So when we move away from that, what we're using instead and promoting instead, obviously there are new methods where we can use human cells. You've heard of organs on the chip, um, where you can look at the effect of uh, a compound on liver cells, on heart cells, on uh, colon cells that are put into a tiny chip and you can put your compound through there. You can even metabolize them through liver cells on the way. And it's like a whole organ system, but it's tiny. It's much more standardizable and it's human. Um, cells unlike the cells of a dog. Now, this still doesn't mean that we have the perfect way to know if drugs are safe. Um, the animal tests don't make them so, and, and, and in some cases the alternatives are imperfect too. We need to continue that work. But the idea of going down the, the, the direction of rat and mouse biology, it's, it's not where we're gonna really, really win. Um, and I don't want people to think you can't win. You can. In the same way as we've eliminated every use of animals in undergraduate medical education in the US and Canada, look with chimpanzees, as you mentioned, uh, everybody who watched Jane Goodall's work uh, and her incredible contribution thought, why are chimpanzees in laboratories? Well, um, we had an opportunity a number of years ago um, to opine on that. And we were able to get a study done by the Institute of Medicine to look at whether we actually needed chimpanzees in research. And we had to work behind the scenes to make sure that the right knowledgeable people were on that committee. But that committee made a determination that you don't actually need chimpanzees for anything. Um, they sent that determination to NIH and NIH to its credit called a complete halt to the use of chimpanzees in research. Now it took them time to do it. They said they were gonna save 50 chimpanzees and hold them just in case something came up. We pushed, we pushed, we pushed. And they finally agreed, okay, U50 can go too. And so they're now in the process of retiring all chimpanzees. And so if you don't need them, they're the closest biological relatives, then you can't make a case for using animals that are more biologically distant. So that's the work that we need to continue, get them all. And notice everybody that what the doctor just said was we pushed and we pushed and we pushed and we pushed. And that is work, that is research, that is policy, that is getting up in the morning, that is getting, you know, getting, you know, getting a team, to, a huge team together to do all this work. And this work does, does need funding. And so, um, so, you know, again, please, if you're going to make a gift and this, you know, I always think this week for me is, is really truly the gift of uh, the season of, of, of obviously spreading joy and alleviating suffering as much as we possibly can. So this is a, this is a, a really important gift to make and just know if you give a, a gift your dollar will be matched will really truly be matched equally um so so please this is this is a very 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 important place to give and and that contribution would be extremely meaningful uh for you to give this week for, for all you you know and i know this community are huge huge animal lovers and already in the chat i've seen you know everybody talking about that so um is there anything else that you want to say on this topic any other call to action um any other um you know last piece that you want to give us of the work that you're do that you're doing this week this year in 2022 of what you hope to see and accomplish in 2022 i'll, I'll mention just one one small thing um we're launching a new division called the research compliance division and this is a, a new division that we are starting that looks at what we call third rail experiments. Um, people might uh, debate whether you need animals for this kind of study or that kind of study, but there are a number of experiments where it is clear from the outset that you didn't need animals at all um, to use this. That's a third rail. Um, and there are a number of others like that. So uh, we have a research compliance division, which is researchers, our researchers, lawyers, um, communications people to get the word out and people to activate our membership to let uh, the world know and to really call foul where there are experiments of this type going forward. So if people would like to support the Research Compliance Division, it's, it's going to make our work that much uh, more rapid. Okay, so it's the Research Compliance Division, but if we donate to PCRM, that money can go to that division. 
It certainly will. Yes, um, I don't. People don't have to restrict their their funds. We we we're we're putting the gas in the tank as much as we possibly can. Exactly. Yeah. Wherever the gas yes. goes in the tank, exactly. it'll go where it needs to go. Exactly. exactly. But but we're yeah. always growing. We're always pushing harder. And luckily, we have the doctors and the scientific minds that that are able to to make this work. So so that yeah. we're we're excited about the new division. It's going to propel us forward even faster. Oh, that's fantastic. Oh, what hope, what vision, what strength to evolve, to change, to alleviate uh, suffering. I mean, I just, thank you, thank you, thank you for the work that you do. Pivoting to another topic for everybody listening before we, before we let you go and get on with, it, with more of this work that you're doing today. If there were, we're going into the holiday season, a lot of us are traveling, there's the new variant the, that's coming and every you know, people are freaking out about, you know, be, be, you know, getting ill and whatnot. Can you give us three tips, three nutritional tips straight from the doctor's mouth to uh, help us to keep healthy, strong, vibrant, and as energized as you are over the holiday season? Oh, what a great question. You know, this is the time of year when it kind of goes in the other way. So as of December 31st at midnight, everybody feels disgusted and they and, and the number one resolution is I'm going to diet. Eat exactly. Exactly. I'm going to eat better in the new year. I'm going to shed yeah. the, 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 the weight. I'm, okay. Um, yeah. Yeah, three, three quick tips. Um, number one, everybody knows this already. Get the animals off your plate. Um, if you do that, there's no cholesterol on your plate. There's no animal fat. That's the greatest thing. While you're at it, you might keep the greasy stuff out too. So that doesn't mean that there's not a lot to eat. There sure is, as you know. Okay, tip two. Uh, if you are with some friends, they've all come to town. They said, let's go out to eat. Where should we go? Uh, my magic words are think international. Your favorite Italian restaurant has the angel hair pasta topped with marinara sauce, arrabbiata sauce, whatever it is. Um, your favorite Chinese restaurant has the rice and the tofu and the vegetable dishes. The sushi restaurant. Yes, there's vegan sushi, yeah. cucumber rolls and asparagus rolls and sweet potatoes rolls. Um, Mexican, you bet. The veggie fajitas, the bean burritos. Think international. Great. It'll always guide you to a choice where there's lots of things on the menu. Um, third tip, get the biggest megaphone you can and let other people know about it because we want to take care of ourselves. But you know what? There are so many other people who have health issues. Um, a little bit of weight they'd like to lose. They'd like to get off some of their medicines if they can. And we can help them, good. In turn, if they're the people we live with, they help, help us. Um, you know, we're buoyed up by our community. So make some noise, share things with other people, um, share a book, share a movie link, whatever it is. Um, they, in turn, will really benefit. You'll never know how many lives you change, how many lives you've saved but I guarantee you it's a huge number. Absolutely, and, and I want to just finish with one little t uh, piece of advice that I heard you recently on the uh, Exam Room podcast, and I thought it was such a l great piece of advice, which is when you go home or you're around people or family or friends or whatever, take a book, right? And it could be a book, it could be one of uh, Dr. Neil Bernard's books, but take a book, or it could be a movie. There's fantastic movies. The Game Changers. Sea Spiracy is a brilliant one recently. You know, What the Health, Cowspiracy. There's lots of these really, really great documentaries that I know have um, changed the way that many of you think. I think Game Changers is a good one because a lot of <coughs> that old chestnut comes up of like, well, what about protein? So it's like, well, here we go. I mean, that's it's all laid out there. But this is the tip that I loved so much because I'm a huge reader. As you said, get a book, give it as a gift, or leave it. I think you said leave it somewhere and put some post-it notes. And I think you said put one post-it note on the front saying whatever it is, and then a couple of post-it notes and chapters. Will you finish with that? Because the way that you laid that out, I thought, oh, what a great piece of advice. Well, I learned this from my mother. I have to tell you, um, she had a high cholesterol level, wouldn't listen to a word I said. And I, I gave her a book. And I came back and visited her about six months later. And you know how you can tell when a book has not been read? You know, <laughs> so I gave her another book. I put a post-it note on the front and it said, Dear Mom, I thought of you on when I read page 159. And I thought of you again on page 172, whatever. So you put the post-it notes in. She'll read the whole book. She'll read it six times. She'll call you up and say, I'm not sure why you thought of me on those pages. I kept reading it over and over again to try to see what you had in mind. Okay. Um, you could do this with a video. You say at about between 45 minutes and an hour 15, 
that was you. They're going to watch that video 25 times and they're going to get the message. So um, it's a little trick. That's, 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 that's a great trick. It really is. I wish I'd known that because I've given lots of books to my family and they got, and I go back to England and there's dust on the cover. It obviously has not even been cracked open. So that's a great one because I, as you say, if you go, I was thinking of you on that particular point, the fascination and curiosity is going to get the better of them. It's like, why was, yeah. why was she thinking of me on that particular page? <laughs> so it's human nature. You're going to dig in. And, you know, really just to tie this up, um, everything today is you know it's the ripple effect i always talk about the ripple effect and you know what you're doing you and what all of you are doing here who are watching and in my community the way you're eating the way you're living the way your commitment to yourself your commitment to kindness and love and evolving and and your health it's, it's never unseen and when you're around your family and your friends they are going to see that they are going to notice it. They're going to feel it on an energetic level. And it's super powerful. So whatever you do, whether you're choosing to take meat off your plate, um, and, and we could have another, you know, uh, two days conversation about this, I know, but whether you're choosing to do that or whatever you're choosing to do, how you're choosing to live is inspirational to everybody around you. And even if they don't say it, and even if they kind of kick and scream, and even if they want to, you know, do whatever they're doing, I promise you that you will leave a little ripple behind you. So leave lots of ripples behind you, everybody, please, this holiday season. And one of those ripples is to donate whatever you can do, whatever you can afford to do, because that's a ripple which is putting gas in that tank um, that can be put to very, very good use and do something that we all in deep in our hearts really, really care about. So I want to wish everybody a happy, happy holidays. I want to wish you particularly, uh, Doctor, a, a, an extremely, I hope you're getting a rest. I hope that you've got some time to take some days off and, and recharge your gas tank a little bit over the holidays. Well, right back at you. I, I hope you do as well. Thank you for all the incredible work that you do to reach so many people and to inspire them too. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for coming on. Give generously, everybody. This is really, really important. Thank you for coming on during this busy, busy week. And thank you, everybody, for watching. We'll have you back in the new year. I look forward to it. Thank okay. you so much. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks.